Okay, so a uh, very good Monday morning to you all and, and welcome to this uh, Erasmus Plus Capacity Building in the Field of Higher Education um, webinar. Um, I'm Sini Pippo, I have my colleagues uh, Anna-Maria Strengel, hello, good morning. And also uh, my colleague Sara Korhonen so, <laughs> here with me um, and, and we are the, the ones uh, spending the next uh, two and a half hours with you. Uh, we have some coffee breaks uh, in between, uh, luckily, and, and uh, Anna-Maria will explain you uh, the agenda for today a bit later. But I just wanted to start by mentioning that in this webinar we are focusing on capacity building projects. It's one of the activities under the Erasmus Plus. Uh, so if you are not familiar with the program um, already, uh, so this is focusing on, on one of the actions. If you're looking for uh, information, for example, on on um, different grants, individual grants. Uh, so we are unfortunately not providing that information here today, but we are happy to guide you further to, to the information that you that you might need. So please contact us uh, by email afterwards so we can we can um, support you then then further. But now we are focusing on capacity building uh, action. And here you have the agenda for us today. The timeline is estimated uh, to, to for the first part to last one hour and 15 minutes, but we'll be flexible with that. So once we are finished with the first part, we'll have a break and then come back to the second part of the webinar. The first part is mainly about the technical issues, so what it's all about, uh, all the principles and policies. And then also the second part is more about the content, the evaluation, the quality assurance, the assessment of the applications. We have also reserved some time for the questions at the end of the webinar, but if you have any questions during the webinar, you may write them in the chat. We don't uh, allow you to talk during the webinar, but you can post any comments you might have uh, in the chat. And you had already sent us some questions beforehand. We'll try to answer those during the webinar. And if you have any other questions in mind, please let us know. This is what we'll go through today in our webinar about the general overview of those capacity building uh, projects, the consortium and financing rules, about the application selection process and procedure, and how to write successful proposal and what is assessed. So we have tips for the applicants as well at the end. This is what we'll go through and we will have plenty of slides, but try to cope with that. Yes, it will be um, a lot of slides. The whole activity uh, requires quite some paperwork and um, and uh, you probably have already looked at the at the application form and all the annexes. So so it's a it's a lot of uh, work, but uh, we'll manage it together <laughs> together to um, in this uh, in this two and a half hours. So um, about generally about Erasmus Plus, um, it's a it's a EU funded program um, divided in these uh, three key activities on policy level, on, on institutional cooperation level, and, and individual mobilities. So um, uh, capacity building in higher education here, um, written in, in this uh, CBHE, um, is, is uh, part of the key action two. So institutions and, and institutional cooperation. Uh, uh, there are a lot of, a lot of other activities uh, under Erasmus Plus as well. And, um, we at the, at the EDUFI, so Finnish National Agency for, for Education, we act as the national agency for Erasmus Plus in, in Finland. We have similar uh, agencies um, around Europe. There are also um, national Erasmus Plus offices uh, uh, in, in the neighboring countries of, of the EU. Um, and um, as a national agency, we are responsible on, on the program management um, of, of different ac ac actions uh, under the Erasmus Plus in capacity building for higher education, uh, we are responsible for providing this type of guidance for applicants. Uh, so we are not um, actually directly involved in the selection of the projects or the project management uh, after the selection process. 
so then uh, then the project will be managed by the by the executive agency in in Brussels and the selection will be made in in, in Brussels as well but edufi is involved in in supporting you as the as the Finnish um, applicants um, to to apply from this from this action uh, and and so as as we are not directly in, involved in the selection we can also also um, comment uh, on your on your application in in that sense but that's the that's the basic background concerning Erasmus plus as a as a program but then uh, looking at the capacity building uh, more in detail uh, the capacity building projects um, are transnational cooperation projects involving uh, several um, countries. Um, it's between higher education institutions uh, mainly and, and the higher education institutions and the participants um, come from um, program and eligible partner countries. We will go through the, the um, in, in detail what, what is meant by the program and, and partner countries and which countries are eligible for, the, for, for this uh, action. But the main focus in capacity building for higher education is modernizing uh, the higher education institutions and systems in the partner countries. So even though program countries are involved in the projects, uh, the main focus um, in this action is to support the modernization of the partner country higher education systems and, and institutions. So that's, um, that's the basic, basic idea of, of this um, activity. And when we look at the objectives of uh, capacity building um, in the field of higher education, as I, as I mentioned, the main, main uh, focus here is, is the modernization of higher education institutions and systems in the partner countries and regions, um, uh, in enhancing the quality of higher education in the partner countries, uh, improving the management and governance, um, um, improving the competencies and skills of the of the graduates in in, in those higher education institutions, uh, supporting internationalization, um, and and re also regional integration. Um, here again, um, the focus is is in the in the partner countries and and in partner partner country regions. And it can be uh, we are focusing on on higher education. It means mainly on the on the institutional level. Uh, that's the priority. But also the national authorities are here involved uh, when when we are looking at, at projects uh, um, that require also the national authorities to be to be involved. But modernization and, and improving the quality of higher education is the is the main focus of this of this activity. So as promised, we'll have a look on the program and partner countries and the lists. So here you can find what is meant with the program countries and partner countries. The program countries are all the uh, countries contributing to the Erasmus Plus program, so all the 28 EU member states but and other program countries, Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway, former Yugoslavic Republic of Macedonia, Turkey and Serbia also from this call on. There was also some questions about UK and their participation in the in the project. Um, as outlined in the program guide, it says that uh, UK can also be part of the the project consortium, but you need to pay, bear in mind that in case the UK. Uh, decides to leave the European Union, then it might be that they also need to leave the project in case UK doesn't uh, conclude an agreement with the EU for other types of funding. So what it means that in case you would be including UK as a partner in your consortium, then it would be good to have enough partners also without UK so that it doesn't endanger your the size minimum size of your consortium in case UK needs to step out of the project as an eligible program country. About partner countries there are certain areas that are not included as partner countries within the CPHE project. So they are mainly industrialized countries that cannot be 
uh, receiving funding from this action. So the, the other countries are listed here, the regions. And as uh, one note for this round of application is that Chile and Uruguay have been now moved part of the region 13, so other industrialized countries, meaning that you cannot uh, include them as a full partner in your project. But in case you want to still cooperate with them, the regions 5, 12 and 13 countries from those uh, regions may still act as associate partners, but they cannot be uh, full partners and they cannot then receive any funding from this action. And all more detailed lists of these categories of regions can be found in the program guide where you can check them. Yes, and also um, worth noting is that uh, Serbia is, will not be part of the part of the country uh, Western Balkans region anymore, um, but will be a full program country from this um, this call 2019 onwards. So if you're looking at the Western Balkan well, Western Balkans uh, project, that's that's a very important information for you. But then uh, going to the principles of, of this uh, of this activity again, it's a institutional systemic approach. So focusing on, on institutional, but also on, on the systemic levels. It's a bottom up program, uh, meaning that uh, there is uh, the focus is on, on the real need in, in, in the partner country for for different projects. Uh, so if you can really um, um, show that there is there is a real need in in the in the higher education system for this type of this type of project, it's that's a that's a that's a good sign. So um, the need re really needs to be proved, and it's it's a bottom up. So so it's a it's a quite flexible in that sense uh, the activity that um, it supports the activities that are that are needed and and can be shown that it's there is a real need for that. Uh, there is involvement of national authorities in uh, in the projects uh, that are focusing on, on system uh, level um, results, then that's a requirement. But uh, the national authorities are actually involved already in the in the design phase of, of this uh, activity when the when the priorities are set. We will look uh, in detail in, in the following slides, but there is a there is a certain um, um, there, there are certain priorities set for each country and at least on, on regional level, what type of um, what type of projects are eligible for those those countries. And that's that's um, um, defined in consultation of, of national authorities and EU delegations. So they're involved already in the in the um, in the design phase and, and defining the, the principles and priority priorities for this for this action. Of course, there, um, the EU Commission is, is looking uh, for sustainable results, and uh, with these projects, so there is a um, there is a strong focus on on, on reaching uh, sustainable um, results, um, and um, also, uh, well, as mentioned, structural impact, uh, um, having an impact on on different national um, legislation and and uh, system level changes is also also one of the one of the principal principles of, of this this action and and revision of higher education systems is can be can be one of the of the seek results of of your project so when we look at the different types of projects that are possible within this action so uh, there are two types of project joint projects and structural projects uh, the main uh, difference between these types of project is the impact, so where the impact lies in the project, and also partly like the participation, participating institutions. So with joint projects, the impact is mainly on institutions, of higher education institutions. And in structural projects, the impact is on a systemic level, so a wider impact, like uh, educational systems or like modernization of the, the different like policies and such. Then again, like under the joint projects that different types of subcategories, which can be applied, uh, for instance, curriculum development, uh, improving the university governance and management, 
or then uh, enhancing the links between the higher education institutions and the wider economic and social environment. Then again, in the structural projects, the, the emphasis is more in the policy level, um, governance and management of the higher education systems themselves, and uh, improving the links between higher education systems and the wider economic and social environment. And as Sini already mentioned, that also including different national authorities might happen mainly under the structural projects. And when applying for this uh, project, then already in the application stage, you'll need to decide the type of project you're applying for and also the subcategory. So you need to decide whether you're applying for a joint project or a structural project. And if for a joint project, then also you need to decide if it's a curriculum development type of project or any other possibility. They are listed in the application form, so it will guide you to choose one of these types. And we'll look at some examples of these different project types. Next. Yes, it's, uh, these are just uh, general examples. Um, what could be what what would be the activities eligible under the under the different uh, different project types so joint projects focusing on institutional level impact um, the the most uh, let's say traditional one or the the most popular one is curriculum development so developing and, and testing and adapting new curricula in in the partner country institution um, while testing uh, new materials methods can be included in that um, staff training, um, including academic and, and non-academic um, staff. So staff development can be in, in, in focus. Also supporting the quality assurance mechanisms, um, for example, uh, supporting internationalization, um, creating an international office could be one, one, of, the, uh, one of the activities. Um, upgrading facilities such as uh, laboratories, libraries, ICT, ICT centers, um, all that could be could be one of the one of the activities in um, in in the project. And uh, when looking at uh, at developing new curricula, it's it's uh, good to see that the accreditation should be should be finalized before the end of the project lifetime. So in in many cases and in many countries, it takes a long time. It's a, it's a it's a long process for the for the accreditation if it's needed. So it's good to take that in into account already when planning your your project. Also looking at uh, any new courses that you are developing, the teaching should start uh, during the during the already during the the project. There was one question in the chat. Shall we take it now or a bit later? Yes, there I, is. Um, so two uh, questions actually. Yes, I, I think I, I could see the question. So there was a question: How many of these activities should be should be included in one project? Yes. So I can just uh, show you the the previous slide. So these are the project types. So you will need to focus or select one of those um, project types. Uh, so you need to need to define which type of the project are you are you going for, uh, if it's a joint or structural, and then uh, under those types you need to select one. But then looking at the activities, it's it's very much uh, up to your project, and and um, you can tailor these these uh, these activities. These are just um, just examples. What could be included in in a joint project uh, on activity level? So um, staff training and, and curriculum development, upgrading facilities, this could, this could be, it's, it's a flexible approach. So these are just examples of, of the activities, depending on your, on your, what are you focusing on in, in your project and what is needed for, for, um, for the results that you are looking for. There's also uh, there another was, other question. And would it be advisable to invite ministries to join projects as well? Mm, in the in the structural project, it's a it's a technical requirement, so it's an eligibility eligibility issue. But uh, it it might be also um, also good to if depending on your project, actually, it's it's always the always the the, the answer is is to look at your project and what type of what type of um, impact yeah impact and, and objectives do you have in your project? So I 
it could be a very good idea to have a ministry uh, on board and, and to support your, your activities. But it's also, um, um, there are many, well, we'll look at the, at the um, how many applications there were in joint project and, and structural, but it could be also that if, if you have a, f a project focusing on, on such uh, changes that you need the ministry in, on, on board um, to achieve those objectives, then it could be that, that then, then you might have a structural project mm. at, <laughs> at your hands and it, it might make sense actually to apply as a structural project because that's uh, there are not so many structural projects um, applied annually, so that could be also a benefit for you. So I don't know if that's a clear answer, yeah. but uh, again, it's it's a flexible flexible approach, and of course you can you can also uh, have the ministry like document that you have the the relevant ministry supporting your project also on um, on joint projects, even though it's um, it's uh, seeking institutional level results. But just as a maybe just to think through that if you need the ministry and, and that's that's very relevant and you're looking for national level or system in that sense systemic changes then it could be a structural project actually when looking at uh, the structural projects uh, these are just uh, examples of the of the activities so so it could be bologna type uh, type um, um, Process uh, process changes that you're looking for introducing ECTS um, system or tree cycle um, system recognition the, enhancing the recognition of decrease qualification frameworks um, and and that type of activities on on national level on on systemic level um, also the assur uh, quality assurance systems um, could be could be one thing to focus on uh, also when when looking at at working with the with the with the wider uh, environment of, of higher education then and and the society then then also this innovative approach in in that so these are just um, just um, examples of the activities it's good to, we have links to when when planning a project it, it is good to to look um, what kind of projects are actually running at the moment so so um, you can you can find a list of selected projects and, and description of, of those projects and and what are they they actually doing at the moment. So it's good to good to see some some uh, real life examples um, before really really start developing your your project. Then um, who can apply? There was also some some questions uh, sent us uh, beforehand on that. So um, as mentioned, um, it's um, it's an institutional level level activity. So higher education institutions are in focus. Um, as applicant, um, uh, you can have higher education institution uh, from partner country or from program country. So both are um, are eligible. There was a question if a, if a mm -hmm. Finnish University of Applied Sciences could be in the role of lead applicant, and yes. The answer is yes, and but also there are no um, limitations here um, on technical limitations here, so it can can be from a program country or partner country. Also, an association or organization of of higher education institutions can be act as the as the applicant, but here you need to be careful because um, well we will go through the minimum requirements uh, for the consortium, how many higher education institutions you need to have on board. Uh, in order to be eligible, and in that case, this association of higher education institutions is um, calculated as 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 what one partner, but not as higher education institution. So it's there are quite um, quite uh, tricky rules on on eligibility, and and we we will focus on that also a bit later. But um, but just that you you already now know if you have that type of plan plan in mind. Also, a uh, national or international um, rector, teacher, or student organization uh, can uh, act as an applicant in structural projects. Then, as partners, um, you can have, well, again, uh, higher education institutions, and then um, any, any other, other uh, type of institution, actually, active in labor market or uh, in education training and, and youth um, um, sectors. And uh, what you just need to uh, need to uh, 
see is, is that it, you, you respect the rules of, uh, of eligible program countries and eligible partner countries. Um, you can also have uh, associated partners that uh, cannot receive funding, but um, that you can document that, that they are supporting your, your um, project and, and they might have some, some um, task, for example, in, in dissemination. So it's, it's also good to have some, some associated partners on, on board, but in that case, you need to be careful that they, they don't receive any funding. So any, any partner receiving funding would be then a participating organization. And there was like in mm. the guidelines, it was also encouraged to the partner country to act as a lead applicant if possible, mm. and if there are resources for that, yes. so that to, to perhaps also to move the focus of the mm. project towards the partner country already at the application stage, but it also depends on resources of your consortium if it's possible, like for them to act as a lead mm. partner, but there's no rule for that, like who can be the lead, the coordinator, mm -hmm. the lead applicant. Yes, and I, I saw that there was a question mm -hmm. about the work packages already. Mm -hmm. So if it's okay, we can discuss that uh, issue when we look at the mm -hmm. at the actual um, work package um, side side of the application. That will be a bit later, but I hope that it's it's okay. Yes. So so this is maybe the main messages are that um, um, it's it's very flexible. So either from program or partner country, you can apply. Uh, there are minimum rules on, on, on the um, participating higher education institutions that we will look in detail um, in, in, in the slides coming a bit later. But otherwise it's, it's, it's a flexible approach. Uh, and then um, we will um, see in the, in, the, in the next part about the consortium that I just mentioned and about the financing rules. Of the, of the projects. Do you have any questions at this point? Um, well, mm -hmm. we noted the one about the work packages, but mm -hmm. what about any, any other questions concerning things that we mentioned now? I guess not, but, but you, can, you can send us questions at, at any time. So in this section, we'll uh, look at the consortium rules about the priorities, uh, budget and, and duration rules, and um, how to calculate the budget, and, and also, also um, about the partnership agreement that is required. OK, so here we are about the, the um, consortium structure uh, requirements. This is something that uh, has caused a lot of questions and also um, it's not as simple as, as you might think, actually. So, so please uh, uh, note that, uh, that take the time to really, really see that, uh, to make sure that your project is eligible. Because if you don't have the minimum number of, of uh, higher education institutions on board, and if your consortium structure is, is that way not eligible, then it will, will not be evaluated at all. So this is, this is very, very important here. So, um, you can have um, either a national project. That means um, uh, that it's um, it's um, one partner country only, or then a multi-country project. This means that you have um, you have at least um, two partner countries on on board. Um, in in both of the cases, you need to have at least two program countries uh, on board, and and here um, at least uh, at least one higher education institution from each of the program countries. So at least two program countries and at least one higher education institution from from those countries. Uh, and in case of national projects, so that means again one partner country is is on board. You will. Uh, need to have a um, minimum number of three higher education institutions from that country. But then again, if you have a multi-country project, uh, then you should have um, minimum two higher education institutions from each of those, those uh, partner countries. 
And uh, for both of, of these uh, project types, uh, you need to have at least as many partner country higher education institutions as the program country higher education institutions. So this make this rule makes sense in 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 such a way that um, that the focus is always on on partner countries. So if you would have um, more program country higher education institutions on board, then also the budget would focus on on the program countries and 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 so on. So so. You need to respect all these all these rules. There is also uh, additional uh, rule for structural projects that we have already mentioned. That the partner country ministry, so the relevant ministry responsible for higher education, uh, must participate as a as a partner in that type of of project because otherwise the the objectives that you are looking for are not not uh, reached. Mm. Uh, and then there are also some exceptions. Uh, that you can, well, we didn't write in detail all the exceptions, but I will mention them here. So about very small countries that you have uh, less than five higher education institutions in total in the, in, in the whole country, uh, or that one of those institutions is um, um, covering more than 50% of the, of the student population. In, in that case, uh, you, you don't need, um, need to respect the minimum, minimum partner country higher education institution rule. Also, uh, there is a rule concerning Libya, uh, Syria and Russia. Uh, they cannot coordinate projects. So even though they are eligible partner countries, they cannot coordinate projects. Um, and in, that, in addition to that, for Russia and Latin America, uh, it's, um, they cannot be involved in national projects. So you cannot focus only on, on Russia or one Latin America country. So you, you need to, if you are working with Russia, you need to include at least one additional partner country in your project. So then it's, it's a multi-country project. The, the same goes for the, for the um, Latin America. Mm. There is a question about the small countries. Uh, and and what about uh, Rwanda? If that's uh, that's an exception, uh, there is a in the guide in the Erasmus Plus program guide. Unfortunately, there is uh, there's no list of these small countries available. But you should make sure from the from the national authorities in that particular country that this is the case at the time when you are applying, and provide uh, additional annex with the statement from the national authorities stating that this is this is the case in their country uh, at the time of of, uh, of the application and and then then uh, it should be eligible for that the reason behind that i know that it's it's a bit confusing and it has been um, causing a lot of uh, discussion and questions during the previous years but um, the the reason behind this this rule is that um, uh, that uh, the commission cannot cannot have the, the those listed updated, but it's it's the responsible of the national authorities to to confirm uh, what is the situation at the time of the of the application in in their countries. But uh, you can contact us and and we can we can uh, support you in 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 looking into this into this rule if if you are working with a small country that could be could be eligible for. For this exceptional rule. About to, in a way, to summarize the, the definitions of national and multi country projects is that because this has been causing some uh, confusion, because it could be said that national projects are one country project, one mm -hmm. target country, and in the multi country projects, you have several target countries. So it doesn't matter like the, the how many countries you have in total, but then what matters is the number of the target countries where the actions would take place. Mm -hmm. So that it would perhaps this clarifies it a bit, because it might be really confusing, like what type of a project it like falls under. Yeah. Yes. And, um, and as this has been um, uh, tricky for the applicants in, in the previous years as well, there is also um, a checklist for the for, for this aspect of, of your project that you can utilize when when checking that that your your project uh, is is um, eligible and what I just wanted to mention uh, as well is that uh, in addition to this um, 
because when looking at the minimum requirements, we are looking at higher education institution institutions. So remember that um, also um, you need to make sure that your the higher education institutions that you're working with are um, are uh, recognized by the by the national authorities of the of the country, and and because there there might be some um, some um, questions, for example, if, if you're working with associations or uh, with research centers or, or that type of, of uh, institutions. So, so make sure that it's, it's a higher education institution recognized by the national authorities uh, and, and producing higher education level decree, decrease or territory level decrease. So, so this is something that, that you need to make sure before, before applying or otherwise the um, you won't, your project won't be evaluated if you, if you don't fulfill these minimum requirements. So is it so that even though you have like associations or research institutes as partners, mm -hmm. like full partners in the project, you will still have to count the higher education yes. institutions? That's what counts yes. for the minimum structure. Yes. And, and, um, and there, there are a lot of questions about can, can you apply with the minimum, um, minimum consortium? Um, so, well, you can apply and, and you, you will be eligible, but it's a rare case that you would be selected with only the minimum number of higher education institutions. Uh, many, well, usually the, the, the projects uh, selected include also um, working life partners, so outside higher education sec sector and, and, and different associated partners, um, kind of a big, big consortium. But it's depending on again. It's depending on 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 your project and what what are you uh, looking for with the with the project and what is the need. It could be also that that the minimum minimum number of higher education institutions is 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 enough for the for the um, for the focus of of your project. Uh, then uh, we have already mentioned about the the um, priorities set for this. Uh, these projects. So, um, um, depending on 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 the country that you are working with, uh, looking at the partner countries, there are different priorities set. So you will find um, in the in the annexes uh, Excel sheets um, for national priorities and also for regional priorities. And national priorities are set for the for the uh, neighboring countries um, of EU. And um, that's that's then um, then um, uh, national priorities. There are, for example, for South Africa, there are also also national national priorities. They are then defined uh, by the ministries of, of ed education in those countries and and with uh, with consultation with the EU delegation in in question. So in uh, and then for the for the um, regional priorities, uh, they are defined by the Commission. Uh, based on the EU's uh, external policy priorities, uh, and and they are set for for one region, uh, so on on regional level. So what this means is that um, to be eligible for this capacity building for higher education, you need to focus on one of the priorities set for the country or for the region. Uh, when you when you look at the list of priorities. Um, you can focus on national priorities, but they are not available for all countries. Uh, in the case that you don't have national priorities for the for the partner country in question, then you should look at the regional priorities. This is clear for the for the national projects. So when you're focusing on 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 one country, but then if you have um, several countries uh, from the same region, then you will look at the regional priorities list. But then, if you have countries from different regions, let's say from um, from uh, Latin America and and Africa, mm -hmm. then you should find a common priority. So it cannot be uh, only a priority for one of those countries or regions, but it should be a common priority. And uh, so you should take a look at the lists and and see, make sure that there is a there is a mark on the on the priority that you are focusing on with your project because again this is an eligibility um, question so if you are not focusing on a, on a priority that has been selected for your country or for the for the region 
in this call, then you are not eligible and your project will not be selected for funding. Uh, and, and we are happy to help you with this. With this, if, it, if you are uh, confused with the, with the priorities, there are big Excel sheets uh, and then also explanation on, on, on those. But the main message is that you need, to, you need to find the priority that is, or fit your project to one of these priorities. Then we'll move on to the budget issues. Um, and we'll talk about the duration of the project. So within this action, you can receive funding for uh, 24 or 36 months. And it is so that it, you can decide it yourself and mm -hmm. depending on the needs of your actions and objectives. Yes. So, so it's up to you to, to decide whether you need 24 or 36 months for implementing your project. The budget for each project funded will be between 500,000 and maximum 1 million euros. And there are different types of uh, costs that can be uh, justified and within this project, uh, diff five different kinds of budget headings. We'll look only those on the next slide. And two different kinds of, or types of, uh, in a way, calculating the costs. Some are based on the real, cost, real costs and some only on unit costs, like lump sums for certain categories. So we'll look at the different budget categories now. So these are different uh, expenses you may apply funding for. Staff costs, travel costs, cost of stay, equipment and subcontracting. So what you uh, see here is that, that the staff costs may uh, constitute only maximum 40% of the budget. So it's not really much in a way if you're including lots of people here. Uh, there are um, funding for travel costs for staff or students moving within your project. And you need to also uh, take note that the, any activities or travels need to be carried out in the countries involved in the project, so between the consortium countries. For cost of stay, any accommodation or subsistence, transportation costs in the local uh, area where you are traveling to or from. And as you see, for equipment and subcontracting, there are also set maximums. So for equipment, it's maximum 30% of your budget and subcontracting only maximum 10%. So this also indicates uh, that there's also in a minor role in your project. Um, and I would also like to mention that, for instance, for equipment, the rules that they should be purchased at the beginning of the project or as early as possible so that you can actually make full use of the equipment that you are needing uh, for the project. And also you need to explain and justify the reason you are for the need of this equipment. It can be different kind of uh, like computers or books journals, uh, any software or any software or comp uh, machines needed for teaching purposes and such. For the subcontracting, the 10% rule indicates that it should be really occasional and only applies for any kind of services you cannot receive within your consortium. So anything you need to like buy from outside uh, service providers, something like they can be IT services or web page design and maintenance, language courses, activities, translation services and such. What we also want to emphasize here is that only these five types of costs are allowed. So any other type of costs uh, cannot be uh, 
mark in your budget. So there's also uh, an expectation for your own co-funding. So any other types of costs need to be covered by your consortium partners co-funding. Uh, in earlier years within the Temples programs, mm -hmm. there has been certain kind of uh, rules for this uh, co-funding or own financing rates, but in here in this pro project type now, there isn't any set rules for how much you need to put in your own money. But at least proceed like to, to give a rough idea to from 10 to 20 percent mm -hmm. to calculate so that you will have also your own funding for instance staff costs might easily like yes be one of those uh, budget categories where you will put your own money in anyways yes and and maybe just to um comment on that. Uh, so previously, because uh, the capacity building for education is continuing the approach of the previous Tempus program, you might be familiar with that. Uh, so in, in that there was a co-funding -fund uh, requirement. Uh, the level of, of unit costs here is set in such a way that uh, the Commission has, has um, calculated that uh, when providing this type of funding, in average, you would then need um, uh, roughly the same same level of, of co-funding co to, to be able to realize the, the project. And, and there was one question about the overheads. Mm -hmm. So that's not provided in, in, it's not an eligible cost in, in, this, in this, um, this project type. Yeah. So staff costs are, are included. Yeah. Also, one question brought regarding the finances is, mm -hmm. is there any problem with applying money also for a ministry of the partner country, like for the costs that originate from this project? Um, well, the, uh, the ministries, uh, the participants from the ministries can can travel with the with the budget, for example. So in, in that there is, there is no no um, no problem in, in that sense. Yeah, that's also all, uh, one of previous question regarding the consortium mm -hmm. uh, like is there so if there are many common priorities we choose to just choose one and focus on it in the case of cross regional projects uh, well well it may it, it's um, so it's on the on the priorities that we yeah, discussed the priorities, yes yeah. so it's uh, when you look at the priorities list uh, you need to you don't need to tick all the boxes, so you don't need to focus on all those priorities priorities set for the for the region or, or country. Uh, you will you will select your your own, so one of those those priorities. Of course, your project can can also um, kind of touch upon on different priorities, and that's a that's a that's a good thing. And you will need to uh, identify the priorities that you are you are focusing on on the on the application. Uh, but one is one is 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 selected in in those lists. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Continuing with the um, budget issues. So as mentioned earlier, that there are two different just justification methods for the costs, uh, unit costs and real costs. For the unit costs, the main question on it is what did you achieve with the grant, like what is the output? And then there's no need to prove the actual expenditure, but there's to, the need to prove that actu activity was justified and properly implemented, that you actually completed the task you were aiming at. And there, this type of uh, costs are the staff, travel, and cost of stay. So these will be calculated as lump sums, and there actually the Excel sheets for budget will calculate these automatically for you when you insert like number of travels to and from different countries, etc. So, and these are also explained in the program guide for each of the category. Uh, on the contrary. For the equipment and subcontracting, they'll be um, reimbursed on a real cost basis. And the, the question would be, how did you use the grant? How, what was your input? And they're actually the actual expenses that you uh, had for those 
two categories and you need to then have all the supporting documents with regards to these two categories. Yeah. So to sum up is that for the real costs that you need to estimate that when um, calculating the budget and bear in mind the, all the maximum amounts like for the equipment the 30% rule and for subcontracting the 10% rule and all the different eligibility rules that you check what is actually eligible under these categories. But for the staff travel and cost of stay they are calculated automatically based on the unit cost uh, sums mentioned in the program guide. Just one more clarification on the on the unit cost approach, so that uh, when looking at the at the unit costs, uh, the the allocation of the grant is based on the on the activities uh, number and volume uh, and nature of the activities that that you have applied the funding for in the application. So that's what the allocation is based on. And when you report on the on the activities for the for the commission or for the executive agency, then you uh, you uh, report um, the activities. But the actual use of the grant is then um, decided in the project in the partnership agreement. Uh, and it, of course, it should be should be clarified uh, with your partners how you actually use the grant. But the unit, unit cost approach means that uh, the grant allocation and also the justification, so the, the reporting of the, of the use of the grant is based on the, on the activities performed. There was also one question regarding <coughs> the costs. Uh, it, is it allowed to include financial auditing costs for the project as subcontracting? Are there recommendations or average estimations for such costs? Uh, for subcontracting, it is possible to include financial auditing costs as subcontracting. It is listed in the annex of the program guide. So that's possi possible to have those. That is a service that you buy from outside of your consortium if you don't have this expertise in your consortium. So then it's uh, uh, justified and eligible as, a, as an action. Yes, and, but, yeah. and, and the audit costs, it would be... Um, I, I'm sure that your financial services is, is very uh, very much aware of the of the different different auditors and the services that, that, that are used for this type of project and it's it will be clarified if a project gets selected in uh, by the executive agency um, on if there are some detailed requirements for the for the auditors but but uh, regular project management auditor um, costs or auditing costs are mm -hmm. here eligible. Okay, so about the staff costs, again, uh, we already mentioned that there are four different categories. Uh, so depending on the, on, the, um, on the task performed, not so much on, on the work title of the, of the person working for the project, but more on, the, on the what type of activity or task he or she is performing, uh, you select the, the staff cost amount. Uh, so manager, researcher, teacher, trainer, or technician, administrative staff. So there is a daily rate for, for this, this type of staff costs. And there is also um, four different uh, country categories for program countries, and then four different country ca categories for the, for the partner countries. And uh, you select the one that, that the, uh, the person is, is um, working for, for, the, for, the, uh, for the, the country of the institution where it's located. If it's... If the person is working um, partly um, in, in an another country uh, included in the project, it's still the, the staff cost rate is based on the, on the country where in, in which he or she is, is uh, enrolled at the, at the institution, so working for the institution. I, oh, yeah. Sorry, this was maybe a bit, bit con confusing, but as, as, a, as a Finnish, uh, let's say, teacher, Working for the university located in Finland, you will use the uh, the uh, staff cost uh, rate for Finland mm. and for for teachers. 
even though you would be working at the partner country partly for the for the project. Yes. So it's mainly about the affiliation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And the Excel sheet will then automatically calculate these for you, even though it might also here uh, appear a bit complex. Mm -hmm. But then it's like that it's automatically then gives you the correct rates for different uh, category of staff and different countries. Yes. And here you should um, just note that, uh, well, again, the Excel sheet is uh, is calculating this and will kind of warn you if you are uh, going above the 40% of your total budget. But uh, there is a limit of, of maximum 40% uh, allocation for the staff cost. This is, um, well, relatively low, uh, maybe compared to, to many other capacity building building uh, projects and and especially if you um, if you are working for example with the with the hey Iki, the um, the program that we are managing from Edofi as well uh, this is this is a different approach so so you need to see um, that uh, the staff costs can be only maximum 40 percent of the total grant then again um, travel and and cost of stay uh, that's um, based on on unit costs and here you can see see the uh, the rates um, for the cost of stay depending if, if if it's concerning staff or students and then uh, the travel costs are based on distance band uh, that uh, they are shared um, there is a there's a distance band calculator uh, that you can find on the on the Erasmus plus uh, website and and there you calculate on which distance band uh, each of the travels actually actually are. So I think this hopefully is, is quite clear, and you can find all these all these tables from the from the Erasmus Plus uh, program guide as well. Then a few words about the partnership agreement. That is a mandatory. Uh, document between all the consortium partners. This is something that needs to be submitted to the executive agency uh, within six months of the signature of the grant contract between the, the consortium and the ex executive agency. But it's really good to start drafting the document already now, if we haven't started so already, because there's lots of uh, critical information that you need to include uh, when well, it comes to the working and the functioning of your consortium, because there are like different aspects of the projects covered, like the old partner's role in the in the project, all the finance and management, so how you allocate funds between your partners, how you manage the project, how you uh, run the quality assurance, and also different kind of mechanism for decision making or in case of conflict cases, the conflict resolution mechanisms. There's a template available for you to use, depending on the type of your partnership, and the document can be joined once so or only one document signed by all the parties, or then. Uh, might be lateral that there's the coordinator uh, signs the agreement with all the different institutions. But this really um, is already something you uh, should be starting to work on early on because it might be uh, also a bit tricky if you only when you the project gets funding, then you start to discuss with your partners how you actually allocate the funds within your consortium or who does who does what and what's the role of each partner and their responsibilities. So that already during the application writing phase, it's good to have some kind of an idea about the distribution of work and the funds inside the consortium. Yes, and, and even though technically it's required to submit the the signed partnership agreement um, to the commission or for, to the agency, so that's the executive agency uh, responsible for the program management of, of this action. Um, yeah, as 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 you mentioned, mm. you should start working with uh, with this partnership agreement early on, so in the in the application phase already, so that you don't encounter any any 
big challenges or or questions um, when already selected. Okay, so then we are moving on to the actual application and selection procedure. Um, Yeah, we still have 15 minutes before our coffee break, so I hope to, that you are still following following us. A lot of information already already um, that we have we have already um, had, and, and now we are we are moving on to this to this actual um, actual application procedure. So uh, important the deadline, seventh uh, of February. Uh, so we have. Um, we have quite early deadline actually when when looking at at the at the date now so um it's coming quite quite uh quite soon um uh, taking into account all the all the technical um requirements um linked to this to this call but yeah it's it's still hopefully doable for for you uh we have uh the um the uh, call for proposals. It was it was uh, published um, in October, and I just saw before this uh, before this uh, webinar that the, also the e form and and other annexes have now been published. Uh, so sometimes it takes some time that the call is uh, is uh, published, and then because there are so many so many um, um, different uh, different annexes that you need. So it takes some time that the commission finalizes the, the annexes for, for, for this specific call. But now they all should be available. Um, uh, then um, you can see the different stages after you have submitted the, the application, what, what is happening then, then um, on, the, on the assessment side um, at, the, at the agency. So there are um, assessment of, of, pro, uh, of um, of um, external uh, experts uh, on your project, uh, expert that uh, experts that really know know the country and know the know the action very well. Uh, there is also consultation with the with the EU delegations and and, and ministries, and then uh, the selection should be should be finalized by August, mm. and then. Um, then uh, your project, if if you get the funding, you can select um, when when you when you are hoping to start with the, with the eligibility period, and um, uh, so it, it can be either in, on fifteenth of November or fifteenth of January, depending how, how how you choose in the in the application form, and then you also select there the 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 length of of your project as. As Anna Maria already mentioned, there was a question regarding deadline, not for this capacity building, but mm -hmm. question: Is the deadline same for the strategic partnership? And it's not. Mm -hmm. The deadline for the strategic strategic partnership projects is twenty first of March, and they also there are several webinars organized for that. Those projects also more specific ones. So um, there was an email on the Edufi Higher Education mailing list where was the, all the deadlines were listed and all the different webinars as well. So in case you're missing that email, please send me an email and, and then we can forward the, that email for you where you will have all those information in mm -hmm. one place. Yes, because under the Erasmus Plus call, uh, as, as we mentioned in the beginning, there are several different actions. Uh, available with uh, different deadlines, so this roadmap is um, is valid only for the capacity building for higher education uh, activity. So the, the Erasmus Plus uh, program involves uh, or includes a lot of different different um, different actions and, and calls under the same umbrella. So, but this is this is for capacity building. And then. Um, Hopefully you are already familiar with the with the agency's website. So um, European Commission's um, executive agency taking care of the of the program management of this capacity building uh, action. So uh, they um, they have published uh, the the call and all the all the information and documents that you need guidelines and and e forms. Uh, and we will uh, see the list of, of required documents um, on the next slide. Uh, but then 
um, this is a website that we can, if we have enough time, we can also um, dive into <laughs> into all these materials together. But but uh, if if you go to the uh, to the Erasmus page of the of the uh, EASEA or, or the executive agency of the of the Commission, and then go to this uh, funding section, and then search for the for the KA2 capacity building um, in the field of higher education. There you will find the call for 2019, and this page is is uh, looks like this. And on the left hand side, you can you can find like the call notice guidelines, how to apply. Uh, e-forms, um, annexes, and then contact information um, if you wish to contact the, the agency directly. So this is, we have also information on our EDUFI website, or oh, it's it's still under the CIMO, um, CIMO website, uh, but um, uh, as, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, the the commission and the, and the ARCR, they are technically responsible for the for the call, for the selection, and then for the management of the project. And we are providing just guidance as a national agency. So all the all the updated uh, information can be found from the from the agency website. And and um, please um, um, well look uh, look carefully into the into this information provided here. There are, well, as already mentioned, a lot of annexes, a lot of information. Also, what is um, useful, um, uh, frequently asked questions and guidelines, and and um, the whole procedure is is really detailed, uh, explained, and there's a lot of support available there. Okay. Then uh, the actual uh, application, um, looking at it uh, technically, it's uh, e-form, so it's a PDF uh, document that will then uh, electro electronically send your application um, once you are you are ready with with all the information. On that e-form, uh, as such, um, it's a it's a separate document as I as I mentioned, but there you mainly provide. Um, general level information and the basic details of your, of your partnership. So you you provide the identification of, of, uh, of the applicant and, and other partners. Uh, then you have a summary of, of your project, what is what is happening on a well, narrative summary of, of the project. And then uh, you need to click on, on this specific information that is related on capacity building that we have been already discussing. You, you select the priorities, what type of um, project is in question, and, and uh, the different indicators. So that's the e-form. And then you have the annexes. And even though they are called the annexes, actual, well, the most important part of, uh, of, the, of the application is the annex number one, detailed project description. Uh, so it's a Word document, and in that it's actually, actually, that's almost the the main application or part of, of the application, because that's the narrative part of, of your, your application where you describe in detail uh, what, you are, what you are doing in, in the project. There are a lot of, a lot of different, um, different parts in, under that uh, detailed project description. Um, and and um, well, it's a, it's a very detailed annex. And, and that's a very, very important part. So the e-form in, in itself, it's more, more of a technical side. And then in, in the annex is the, the, the most important information is then, then written on. So in addition to this uh, detailed uh, project description, you have then a budget table. And um, as, as Anna-Marie already mentioned, that, um, the budget table is, is partly automatically calculating the different uh, different um, unit costs and and all that, but it's it's also um, also a very detailed budget, uh, and then you need a declaration of, of owner as as the applicant or the applicant needs needs to submit that, and then the mandates from the from the partners. And as a technical requirement, again, you need to have an ECAS account uh, when you when you. Um, um, when you are applying with this uh, with this e-form, but it's all uh, all explained in in great detail when you go to this uh, call website, and there you can find also the technical uh, technical um, support.
for when looking at the at the e-form and and also uh, the parts of of the uh, the e-form and the annexes are are ex explained in this. Um, there is a document called Instructions for Completing the Application Package, and and there you can you can find a lot of useful information um, and and information on the on the details of, of each of the each of the part of the application package. But then um, before the before the copy, uh, I just wanted to show or we we took some some figures and uh, statistics from from last year's call. Uh, in general, we can we can look at the at the overall success rate. So last year it was almost seventeen percent, um, and you can see the success rates for seventeen and sixteen on the right hand. Um, right hand side um, so that's the overall success rate but as you can see um, there are because the budget is is divided in these different regions there are different success rates for each of the regions and uh, you will see the the budget in after a couple of slides but but the the big budget is available for the for the Asian countries and here the success rate has been has been on Quite high, so 30%. But as you can see, uh, it it has been uh, even 68% in 2016. So uh, the budget for Asia is, is quite quite big. Also also this year. But otherwise, it's it's of course. Uh, and then for South Africa, as you can see, it's a it's a more small budget. But then then again, the success rate has been has been quite high. But don't be dis discouraged if, if you are focusing on, on one of the regions with a bit lower uh, success rate, uh, the quality matters and, and, and you, you might, might have very good chances to get selected. But this is just as a background information for you. And here you can see that, uh, well, hopefully you can see it's a, it's a quite uh, small print now, but Finland um, has been quite active, especially in the in the in the recent years, so here you can see the blue column stands for partners, and then uh, the green one for, for for applicants in selected projects. So here you can see that the uh, six projects uh, selected were coordinated by by Finnish uh, institutions, and then then uh, fourteen um, partners were involved in the in the selected projects in addition to the to the coordinators. So that's that's quite a good good number compared to the to the previous years and and Finns have been active so then uh, just a couple of slides just to show you what type of project have been have been um, selected in the in in the 2018 call here you can see that um, when uh, when looking at uh, curriculum development type of projects uh, it's uh, that that's the that's the most um, popular one uh, it doesn't mean that that uh, you should focus on that. It's actually, um, well, uh, the commission is always looking at, at selecting diverse projects. Uh, so, so of course, the curriculum development uh, projects are needed and 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 they are very relevant. Uh, but they are also uh, at the moment uh, dominating <laughs> dominating the selection as well. So it's it's not it's not to say that it's. Um, it wouldn't be. It might be your benefit if you are focusing on on some other section than curriculum development. But that has been traditionally the the most popular um, project type. And then looking at uh, if you're focusing on curriculum development, uh, the sub subject areas uh, under that. I don't know if you can see. It's it's very very small print but health and uh, education agriculture engineering um, IT uh, environment uh, environmental sciences are are um, have been popular and again um, on on the different uh, yes the slides will be available and also a recording of this of this webinar will be will be available so maybe, if, if it's too small print, um, it's, it's just to show you the, the var variety in the selected, selected projects concerning different 
different um, project types and priorities. So it's also also very much uh, encouraged that uh, that you um, you take a look at the project that was selected in 2018 and even even before that uh, uh, we will discuss it more more after the coffee break but just to know what type of projects have been have been selected and 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 what has been funded before but then just some information about the about the budget uh, before uh, before some some key messages for this call and then the coffee. Uh, so here you can see that the the budget for for Asia is is very big or uh, a very big share of the budget uh, in this activity is is um, allocated for Asian countries. Also, you can see that the the neighboring countries of of uh, of the EU are they have a large share of the budget as well. And when looking at the actual numbers. You can see that the budget um, this year is, is is higher compared to the one available last year. So 148 8 million euros divided in these different different uh, regions. And as as mentioned, as you can see, the the budget for Asia is 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 a is a big one. Uh, also, the the neighboring countries, South Mediterranean, Eastern Partnership, Western Balkans. Those those budgets are, are are also also high ones. And around um, well, it's an estimation depending on the on the budget um, in the in the selected project. But around one hundred and seventy two projects will be then will be then uh, selected. That's the estimation. Then the key messages. Um, Especially if you are if you are already um, familiar with the with the active activity, so uh, in 2019 again, uh, the Commission is continuing uh, in encouraging the cooperation with the Asian countries because of the large share of the of the budget. Then diversification of projects, as I mentioned, you you can take a look at the slides and see the see the different type type of projects that were already selected. So. Um, it's a priority to have um, um, as diverse projects as, as possible. Uh, again, the attention to national and regional priorities. So this is mentioned uh, because um, in, in some cases uh, the projects have not been eligible because they don't fit to the, to the priority set. So that's, that's something that, it, that is, is very important to look carefully into. And um, well, if it's cross-regional, then make sure that it's, it's also um, relevant for all, all um, countries on board, looking at the, at the partner countries. There is also additional priority concerning um, migration and, and activities supporting, supporting um, higher education for, for, um, for refugees. And you can, there is a separate document focusing, focusing on that. Um, uh, then, uh, well, again, the attention to eligibility criteria, for example, the consortium, and and of course the information should be coherent in in different parts of the of the application then just maybe this is repetition from what we have already already said but the the case of uk serbia chile uruguay um, these are something that you need to um, carefully look into if you if you are working with those countries uh, and then there is extra budget for ukraine georgia and tunisia um, and the detailed description of the project. Uh, I will mention this once more <laughs> after the coffee break, but um, the annexes that you are using, if you have applied uh, during the previous years, please make sure that you are using the templates of 2019 call. Otherwise, again, you will not be eligible, even though it would be actually the same, same template. But please make sure that you use the 2019 Templates. There are also some revisions of the of the annexes. For example, the detailed description of the project uh, is now uh, slightly different for joint projects and and for structural projects. Also, small revisions in the in the budget tables. So make sure that you are using the the uh, the current template. Again, just to mention the the 
key messages uh, from the Commission for, for this call. So, um, priority or special attention will be given to proposals focusing on, um, on or involving uh, least develop, developed countries from the region, um, involving universities in more remote areas, maybe with, uh, with a little bit less, less experience um, in this type of, of activities. Also um, involving disadvantaged students um, is, is, a, is a benefit or priority in this call and, and involving students with special needs. So these are, these are some, of the, some of the additional priorities or, or um, in, well, encouragements for, for you as, as, as an applicant. Yeah, and these also in, are in line with the larger commission mm -hmm. guidelines yes. and principles of like equity and um, equal opportunities for all and also like the geographical coverage uh, within all those program actions so that is not only for this action but mm -hmm. for different other EU E plus program actions as well so that there are larger principles behind these kind of uh, uh, priorities so yes okay but now uh, it's the time for for the coffee break we will take 15 minutes for mm -hmm. the for the coffee break so it's already 20 past so um, 11 35 yes 11 35 we will be back and you can send us questions during the during the coffee break if you, if you wish to do so uh, and we can at least at the end of the webinar we can then um, go through all the all the questions if, if we don't do that uh, during during our presentation so let's continue in in 15 minutes Okay, so now we are back uh, and we will continue with uh, what is assessed um, in your proposal and how some tips on how to write a successful proposal. So hopefully you had some strong coffee <laughs> and, and you are ready to, to continue. So we will have around one hour if we have a lot of questions and a lot of discussion. Afterwards, we have some flexibility on that, but we will try to Try to finalize in, in one hour, in the official time that we, we announced in the, in the beginning. So, just uh, first to start, when, when, when looking at the, at the assessment and, and the qualitative aspects of your proposal. The basics uh, is uh, on, on how to start with your, with your project idea. So, in ideal case, uh, the initiative uh, would come from the target region, from the target higher education institution and, and country, based on the real needs of, of the partner country, so locally. Um, your uh, project idea should be then fitted to the capacity building objectives and priorities, um, so pay attention to those. In, in an ideal case, your project uh, will reflect uh, the internationalization strategy of the of the partner country institutions but to support your your involvement in that in in an ideal case of course your your institution's internationalization strategy as well um, so that you have the the support uh, from the leadership of, of the institution or um, in in your consortium in in all the institutions uh, also, you you uh, you should uh, know the other initiatives and projects uh, um, uh, acting in in the same country or who have been focusing on the on the same problem or um, uh, what you are focusing on, so that you you ensure that your project is is complementary uh, complementar to those uh, those initiatives and and not uh, doing the same same activities again. Um, then, of course, innovative in, in, in that sense that it's, um, you are doing something new that has not been done before. Of course, it, it makes um, uh, sense also to build on the previous experiences and if you're focusing on, this, on the same subject area, let's say, and, and just that you know the previous projects and you build on them 
so that you are innovative in, in that sense. It doesn't have to be always a completely new subject area or a completely new idea, but uh, innovative and, and um, respecting the complementarity as a, as a principle. So, yes. I'm still wanting to, to underline the fact that we already mentioned earlier, but that the focus of the project will be in the partner countries. So, the, for instance, developing the teaching or uh, any degree programs of a partner country. So, with this funding, you are not able to develop your own funding, mm -hmm. for instance, that even though you will be participating in the pro project, it's not that you will be developing uh, the teaching of a European higher education institution mm -hmm. at the same time. It might develop like a side effect, but it's not the, at, uh, the focus of the project. That, that That's really a big uh, emphasis on that when you're like crafting your project idea. Yes. And then the different criteria that will be assessed when you submit your proposal. So we will go uh, each of these um, in detail through. So the eligibility criteria, exclusion and selection criteria, and then the award criteria. Looking at the eligibility criteria, it uh, involves the formal submission requirements so that you are using the right templates, uh, the right e-form, and you have submitted your proposal uh, in time. You respect the grant size and duration uh, rules. Um, and you also fulfill the partnership requirements. So the, the requirements that we're, we have been already discussing on the minimum number of higher education institution and, and the status and, and all the rules uh, related to that aspect. And um, as, as we already also mentioned that the, the eligibility is not always a simple task to fulfill. Um, so please please pay attention to this uh, eligibility criteria. So looking at the documents, be consistent that you, you really have the correct uh, names and titles and details of the participating organizations. Um, you conform all the, all the formal requirements. So as mentioned, the templates and, and forms. Uh, and as mentioned, it's, uh, it's even separately highlighted in this call that if you don't use the 2019 templates, then you are not eligible uh, for evaluation. So, so pay attention to that. Um, then that you have a com com the completeness so that you have all the, all the required, required annexes and, and documents provided um, with, your, with your application. And once more the, about the partnership that you fulfill the minimum requirements and um, you have the separate tips and checks for eligibility document available where you can check that you, your partnership is, is eligible for this call. And then again, the priorities, as mentioned, it's an eligibility criteria that you, your project fits to one of the priorities set for the, for the partner country or for the, for the region and that the focus on activities are, are um, eligible for this, for this call. So you should um, uh, read carefully the Erasmus Plus program guide, uh, the parts focusing on, on capacity building, uh, and then the Excel sheets covering the priorities. Yeah, I think it's a good idea to also then explain in, the, in your annexes, in the actual, the, where you describe your project that how you comply with these uh, priorities and the rules of the capacity building project, like mm -hmm. if there are certain kind of key uh, areas of emphasis within this capacity building project, that you explain that yes, we address this, this and that uh, priority by doing this, this and that, so that, that we, to clearly actually to spell it out how you are in line with the scope of the EPAS capacity building project. Yes, and, and as mentioned, these are the eligibility criteria. So it doesn't matter how uh, high quality your proposal otherwise is, if you don't fulfill the eligibility criteria, then your proje project or proposal will not be evaluated and is not eligible for the call. So that's why we are really emphasizing these, these, um, these rules. So pay attention to those. Then uh, the exclusion and selection criteria, that's 
that's a very, let's say, basic criteria linked to the EU funding, um, for example, the legal person status of, of, of the applicant's uh, organization that you have all the, all the signatures, you have the financial capacity and operational capacity to, to run this project projects but it's it's um, this is not so so complicated so then we go to the let's say to the beef to the assessment criteria here um, the projects uh, well the selection is is uh, mainly based on on quality so um, there are other other aspects that are considered when when making the selection for example geographical balance and and um, and the consultation with the with the local authorities, uh, but um, mainly the selection is is based on on the on the quality and the and the points that you you get from this assessment criteria. The maximum um, is hundred points, and uh, the minimum that you need to have uh, in order to be again considered for funding it's sixty points overall for all these four criteria. Uh, and when looking at the criteria, you can see that the first two ones, uh, relevance and quality of the project design and implementation, they both uh, cover 30 points. And in addition, uh, there's a threshold for relevance. So you need to have minimum 60 points overall and at least 15 points from the relevance category. So it's really emphasized um, and the most important category here. Then you can see that uh, 20 points you can um, score from uh, quality of the project team and the cooperation arrangements, as well as impact and sustainability. And what we we will now present here is that we go in detail relevant uh, well criteria by criteria um, the uh, the uh, points that are asked and and evaluated, and then we have some tips linked to to each of the criteria. Before moving mm -hmm. on, there was one question uh, to a previous uh, topic. Okay. And where are the national and regional priorities usually published and available? So they are available on the uh, Commission website mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. We can then, of course, send a link for yes. this whole uh, yes. the website where you can find all the annexes, all the e-forms, and all the guidelines. So there are. Uh, um, available there on the Commission website. So yes. the different Excel sheets with the regional and national priorities. Yes, we have a link to the to the call website uh, at the end of this uh, this PowerPoint uh, presentation. And then if we have time, we can also look into the website mm -hmm. together. So but it's it's um, with the materials of the of the call. OK, so then um, going to the award criterion number one and the, the most important where you need to score at least half of the points, so 15 points, is, is relevance. And relevance is here the relevance for the, for the partner country, the relevance of your, of your project and proposal for the, for the partner country that uh, you are addressing um, priority and objective of the, of the call um, for, for that uh, uh, for that partner country and, and, and region, uh, it should be um, should be um, focusing on the on the real needs from the higher education institutions from the from the country or the or the region. Um, so you you have um, done a needs analysis and, and and you can really really show that you are you are focusing on a on a real need in that partner country. So you can start with the with um, social economic uh, need, for example, what type of uh, skills would be would be needed at the at the labor market of that of that country, and then move into the higher education sector. Do you have uh, that type of um, training available at the higher education system and, and, and sector at the moment, and and then uh, move into into the institutional level? What your project is actually doing? To improve the situation and to to kind of question uh, well, uh, kind of uh, to to um, solve this uh, this question or this this problem, uh, you should uh, define the target groups that you're addressing very clearly on on different levels. 
So it's it's very clear what you are doing and 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 what are the target groups. Uh, then you should be able to to show that you know what is going on, what has already been done um, with uh, with other projects. So the innovative character and and the complement. Uh, character of, of your, your project. And then uh, how the project was prepared. What is uh, meant here is, is mainly that how, how the partner country partners were involved. As, as, as we have been highlighting um, for so many times already, the focus is, is in the partner country and in an ideal case, the, the also the, in, um, the, well, the need is, is, is defined by the partner country. Um, partners and and the need is coming from from the from the partner country so so you need to also uh, explain how the project was actually prepared when when submitting the proposal how the partner country um, partners were involved how how was the needs analysis how how did you come up with the, with this project idea and and how do you know that it's relevant for the for the country in question we have again. Um, I apologize. This is very, very small, small print. But some, some tips uh, concerning, concerning the relevance. As mentioned, needs analysis is is very central uh, for for this type of of project. So that you can really show that you are providing solutions for for real problems and and needs uh, in the partner country. And and you can include different levels. Um, and, and um, capacity so um, so um, and and also the the priorities that that you are you are answering so so on different levels you can show the the need and and what you are what what is your project uh, answering to um, and then then you should be able to show that uh, okay you are you are bringing with this project a solution to a specific problem or a need, and then show that you have all the relevant partners on board, on regional, national, institutional, and individual level, to be able to to um, to uh, really really solve this 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 problem. And then there is a separate question on European added value, and and uh, as the focus is on partner country, this is a this might be a little bit uh, confusing the question what the European added value here is. So what is meant here is that why do you need the EU funding for this project? Why cannot be um, this type of project done with the with the national level funding or some some other type of uh, consortium? So you need to show that. Uh, why the European partners are needed for for the project? Yes, so that's what what is meant with the European added value that you need to show. And then, it's it's uh, again it's uh, it's important important that that you are even though the the uh, the expertise from the EU countries is essential for the project and 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 you will you will need to need to explain that. Uh, your project cannot be EU export in that sense that uh, you say that okay we have developed this and this study program now we are exporting it to to this uh, this other country uh, so the need should be should be coming from the partner country and then contextualized and and tailored to this national uh, situation and and um, needs uh, so in 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 that sense the joint uh, preparation of the of the proposal is very essential. Um, then um, one of the, the tips is to link really your um, your proposal to, of course, to the Erasmus Plus program and the priorities uh, and the and the priorities in the call, but also in the in the uh, national higher education uh, policy and the local level uh, local level uh, policies maybe sectoral development plans, um, if available, then the higher education institution level, the, the internationalization strategies, uh, and, and different, uh, different um, target groups that you can link to this proposal. Uh, and, and as mentioned uh, already, uh, the complementarity is an is a important uh, aspect. So, uh, Please uh, look into the, of course, the capacity building projects that uh, have been selected to that uh, to that field and to those countries that you are focusing on. Other EU projects, maybe UNESCO, World Bank projects that are 
um, have been active in, in that field and, and show um, in your proposal that you know what type of projects have been running and, and how your project is then then innovative and, and bringing something new to this to this um, context. And um, well, if you are working with the with the neighboring countries countries of the of the EU, uh, you have the national Erasmus Plus offices available, and and they are very good uh, information point for you, uh, also concerning the previous project and and also the needs, the specific needs of the of the higher education sec uh, sector of that of that country, and and you can we have also a link uh, to the to the contact details of the of the national Erasmus Plus offices or NEOs in those countries. So that was about the, the relevance um, criterion. Um, then moving on to the quality of design and um, and implementation. So here, uh, what is what is assessed? Uh, because in in the previous uh, section, you you explained what you are doing and 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 on why. Um, no, sorry. Um, so um, yes, and and here you you will then continue explaining how you are going to do do this uh, this um, these activities. How are you going to um, going to uh, implement the the project and what type of activities have you have you selected? Uh, and so it it really covers the whole um, whole project. So including the objectives and and activities. The whole um, content and, and approach that you are you are uh, you have selected, and then also the involvement of, of, of different uh, stakeholders and the quality control processes. So um, the project design is is here in in, in focus. So um, the specific objective objective that you are focusing on in the, in your in your um, proposal so what do you promise to deliver with your project and then uh, divide it in 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 outcomes and and results um, uh, in in work packages and then activities so this is actually the uh, on the next slide you will uh, see the the logical framework uh, matrix that is included in the in the, in the application so this is the logic in, in that as well. But it's important that uh, for each of the activities that you are planning, um, you clearly define uh, the aim, uh, the content, and the method that you are, you are using, uh, the, the length of the, of the activity, and the partners involved, as well as the target group. And um, for many of you um, that have already been active in, in, in this type of projects, you know the logical framework matrix well. But just as a, as a reminder uh, that uh, this is a project planning and, and design tool and, and also a monitoring tool um, during implementation. And it's, it's part of the detailed description of the project. And this is a, this is a part of the, the application that uh, when the evaluator starts reading your proposal, uh, the LFM is is in many cases the well almost the first thing that they are they are looking at. So it should be it should be clearly um, written um, in in the application package. It's it's really the unfortunately it's limited I think to two pages. So it's it, it might be quite challenging to fit all the information of. Of um, of your project uh, clearly into this into this uh, LFM, but uh, please uh, pay attention that it's a, it's a, it, it's also an important part of, of your um, your proposal. Uh, so it really clearly shows the logic behind behind your your pro proposal and all the activities that you have planned. So you you defined the wider objective that. Uh, that uh, uh, is, is kind of on the impact level. So um, you are contributing to that wider objective with your project, but you will not reach that during your project lifetime. But then on the second level, the specific uh, objective of, of your project is then the promise of your delivery of, of, your, of your project. And then, then the, the uh, outputs, uh, outcomes, and activities linked to that. They are then uh, the on, on the level of, of your of your project uh, activities, 
And then uh, you set indicators and assumption of, of risks in, in this same table. So it's a, it's a very comprehensive um, and, and important part of, of your, your application package. So, of course, the, uh, the criterion two is, is not, uh, the evaluation is not based solely on, on the, the LFM. It's based on the, on the whole, um, whole project, uh, project design. Um, so, how well your, your design of the activities and, and the whole, whole project is, is fitting to this, uh, to this um, uh, objective, objective that you have set for the, for the project. But I just wanted to uh, remind you of the of the LFM because it it uh, it could be a good idea to start with the with the LFM when you are thinking about planning in in detail the the project structure. Then um, the the criterion uh, number three quality of of the team and. And cooperation. So um, it's uh, well following uh, all that has been said that you have you can show that you have all the all the relevant skills and, and competencies on board. That your consortium um, really has the has all the all the relevant skills with the with the partners and all of the all of the um, partners uh, have very uh, well defined role in the project so you can you can uh, show for each of the partners and what are the competencies and and expertise that they are bringing to the project what is the role for them and 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 so that um, all the all the partners have um, clearly defined roles and and competencies that they are bringing to the to the um, project but also that the project consortium as a as a whole uh, is including all the all the competencies needed to uh, to implement this this uh, this project and um, yes uh, so then um, maybe there was a question about the work packages actually so maybe we can raise that uh, it was uh, um, earlier before the coffee break about the work packages and if it's uh, if it's okay to have a program country and the program country lead multiple work packages Yes, uh, so uh, when you are planning the project, um, you you will have then separate work packages that you that you are um, well dividing the project act activities into, and then you need to al always set a one one leader for the for the work package. So the question was if it's a program country can lead multiple uh, work packages. So the answer in in, in general is yes, but then um, also when looking at the um, suitable distribution of tasks. Uh, if we think about that, the focus should be on on the on the partner country. Uh, so you should at least have some of the work packages uh, led by partner country institutions. Um, well, typically it could be, for example, dissemination uh, work package, part of part of maybe management, and so depending depending on um, on on your project. So dissemination and exploitation work package could be one that, that typically would be would be led by the partner country institution. Maybe also if you are uh, performing a needs analysis in the in the beginning of the project, that could be then also also led by the by the partner country um, higher education institution. Mm. Yeah. So so you you just need to be careful that it's uh, it's balanced the the um, the work packages so that you have well at least one of the work packages should be led by the partner country institution and in in such a way that uh, all partners have relevant roles in in the in the project of course it's not required that the the institutions that are not um, that do not have the resources uh, for for coordinating a project or um, um, don't have that much experience in, in, in project coordination that they don't need to need to bear uh, as much responsibility for the work package um, work, work packages as the as the others that are more um, experienced but uh, there should be uh, relevant roles for, for all of them and also take into consideration that the, there is a there is um, balance when looking at the program country and partner country division. There was one question. Mm -hmm. 
so there can be only one leader in each of the work packages at least based on the application mm -hmm. form or the description of the project it seems so that if they only ask for lead organization and participating organizations mm -hmm. or organizations as I think you should read actually that it like but only you could list only one lead organization yes here. but then then you can have um, of course you can then uh, see flexibly what type of role for the for the others is in in that work mm -hmm. package so when thinking about how about allocating the the resources yeah tasks and and so on yes and and then uh, also what um what uh, should be taken into consideration when when looking at the at the um, distribution of, of tasks is is again the uh, the complementarity. So uh, especially when looking at the at the partner country institutions, uh, you have several institutions from the same country. It doesn't all the partner country institutions don't have to do the same level of of um, of uh, activities or contribution to the project. So in um, it's it's actually quite typical that some of the or one of the partner country institutions is is kind of in a leading role in the in the in the country or in the region and kind of supporting the development of the other partner country institutions. So don't be alarmed if you if you see that it, it would be relevant for your project to kind of have uh, one of the more more <laughs> Uh, experienced partners uh, in in kind of like a, like a local uh, leader role uh, in in that sense. So so it's it's always that each of the partners just should have a relevant and clear role, and then the distribution of tasks and the budget should should then um, also go in line with that. And also the expertise of each mm -hmm. partner uh, can be and should be also taken into account. For instance, mm -hmm. that you. If you have had any prior experience with these kind of projects, or any of your partners have had, so then you list that under the like, the reasons for why this organization mm -hmm. has the necessary expertise for running the project, and so on. That, or if you have any experience of working together earlier with this consortium, or this kind of all that that all like give uh, indications of the quality of your team and of the cooperation mm -hmm. that you've been running several uh, different kinds of projects earlier together. So that that's a sign of, uh, of uh, competencies needed mm -hmm. for such a project. There's also, also one other question about the work packages. Can dissemination and management form one work package? So is this here that the, these are there in the application form? There are all some different kind of ready-made yes. work packages. There are some uh, templates, kind of uh, predefined uh, work package uh, types that you have. It's preparation, development, quality plan, dissemination and exploitation, and then management. And these type of work packages, to my understanding, you need to have at least one of of each type, and then you can copy and. Uh, copy and paste these tables as, as much as you, you need. So, but based on this, it seems that you cannot combine management and dissemination because they're listed here as separate work packages, at least here for the joint project. Hmm. Hmm. But we can also, if you have some, we can look into your proposal and um, set up a, a separate Skype call after looking at, if, if we are working on, on your document, we can look into that and, and discuss um, then bilaterally on, on this question. Because it's a flexible approach again, but, but there are some, some like technical limitations as, as well. But again, um, for the criterion number three, uh, again, well, we have been talking about the quality of the team and, and the cooperation, but looking at the, especially on the cooperation side, so that uh, how how it will be evaluated how have you planned the communication between your partners and and how the coordination and management side will be will be handled uh, that you have a really effective communication plan plan in place yes do we have something else here yes maybe just um just to mention that the the complement complementarity of the partners that's that's more for, for the EU partners. 
So mm -hmm. because we are focusing on the partner country higher education, so um, so it can be can be somehow overlapping the roles of the of the, of the partner country institutions. Uh, but then for the EU partners, you really need to show that uh, uh, what are the competencies and the roles that they are they are bringing to this to this uh, proposal. And especially if you are involving uh, more than one institution from one program country, then you really need to show that why is this uh, uh, essential for your project? Why is the, what is the what is the Added value. Uh, added value of having two program country partners from the same 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 country. For instance, from Finland or mm -hmm. Germany or where your partners are. Yeah. And again, maybe maybe a bit repetitive, but still. Uh, so again, uh, the the team um, that you have the necessary competencies and and. Com complementary competencies on board again particularly on the on the European side um, yeah some aspect that we have maybe touched upon but not discussed in, in detail is involving the newcomers when it comes to the to the partner country higher education institutions uh, so please look into if, if you can involve uh, some newcomers to this type of, of projects uh, um, if, if you can have a higher education institution from different part of, of the country uh, to support the the, uh, the regional diversity and uh, and uh, also including institutions from re more remote areas, not only from the capital city, so that's that's also appreciated. And um, <clears throat> one aspect is the importance of non-academic partners in in many of the selected projects. If you look at them, they they have um, involved some non-academic partners, either as full partners or as associate partners. So that's that's something that's that's uh, important for you to look at, because when when um, showing that there is a real need for for your for your project and you are you are really um, solving a, a real real problem and 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 kind of answering a, a need in the partner country, then also involving the non-academic partners is. Is, is very important. And then um, the ownership, well, again, of the of the partner country, so that it's uh, the ownership of the of the partner country institution and the partner country uh, is shown in in all aspects of your of your project. So again, in the when looking at the work packages, when looking at the at the um, budget um, and the and the distribution of of resources between different partners um, and and in the responsibilities so that it, it really shows that uh, there is the real and strong ownership from the partner country that you are focusing on in your in your project then finally uh, the the fourth and, and last um, word criterion is impact and sustainability including actually also dissemination that would be included in in this in this uh, criterion so it's um, um, so that you have um, you have um, good impact in, in in your in your project and and what are the expected impact in at different levels um, so that you you clearly show that uh, that it's uh, what is the impact uh, outside the, the immediate immediate um, consortium and, and what is uh, what is there after the EU funding because of course the Commission is looking for sustainable results and, and development of the of the partner country higher education systems so um, you should be able to show that uh, that uh, this these results will will be sustainable and and uh, continue even after the EU funding uh, is not available anymore and uh, the dissemination strategy that's very important from the beginning of, of your project um, uh, and then um, yes I will actually go into the because I think it's a bit overlapping <laughs> uh, when we look at the at the tips so uh, three different aspects or levels of, of sustainability that you should uh, well in ideal case uh, be able to show in your proposal 
uh, on institutional level, you should be. Um, uh, it, it would be good to show that there is um, human capital, so resources uh, available even after the after the EU funding. Who is responsible um, for the activities uh, when your when your project has ended? How how if you have a plan, for example, to to set up some local uh, resource persons, who would be the who would be the one? Um, taking taking this well continuing these activities and and if there is a institutional level uh, involvement ensured at the at the partner country institution and 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 there are the the resources available to continue the the activities and of course uh, uh, the the recognition of, of of the results on institutional level but also uh, for example, the accreditation of, of new programs, if, if that's uh, required in, in that national system, then, then that's one, one, um, one aspect of, of sustainability that, that you can show that you have a good plan on, on how to get the, the new program. For example, if, if you are uh, planning on, on, on introducing a, a new program that requires accreditation, how, how have you planned that and how does that go in, um, in in, in real life and, and after the project lifetime. And then again, uh, also the physical infra infrastructure, that's not, uh, that's, that's also an uh, important uh, aspect. Um, if you are um, buying some equipment for the, for the partner country institution, how do you, how do you maintain the, the, the equipment and, and the, the programs and, and facilities? So uh, if, if there are, enough resources to, to really have sustainable results in, in, in that sense. So it's good to explain how, how this, also this, um, when looking at the technical aspects and the equipment, how do you ensure that uh, those resources are available after the, after the EU funding. And on financial sustainability, uh, if, um, if some kind of um, business plan or financial plan uh, it would be good to to present in your in your proposal where do you get the funds after the eu funding has ended so that's the that's the basic basic question so how how do you ensure that the the results well let's say it's a it's a it's a study program how does it continue after the eu funding is if there is if fees are are introduced or um, what type of uh, financial plan will be in place after your project and 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 what kind of, kind of income generating activities there are. And then on, on political level, how to ensure that the results are sustainable when looking at the, at the political level as well. So looking at the dissemination activities, uh, it would be a good idea to involve the, the decision makers um, from the very beginning so that they, they at least know that this type of project is running if they are not co directly involved, that they, they are aware that uh, that you are you have this type of project and 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 so that you can you can um, have their support because that's of course very important when looking at the at the at the sustainability um, on on national level that that you have the support of the of the decision makers and and um, yes to show the, the impact beyond the participating institutions. So again, coming back to the, to the relevance aspect. So if you are showing on institutional level that these uh, results uh, will be sustainable also, uh, you might consider reflecting the, the uh, results for the, for the labor market and then for the wider um, society. And as mentioned, uh, there is a lot of uh, small text, but these slides will be available um, afterwards, so you can take a look at them. Um, but then finally, we have now gone through the assessment criteria. But just to remind you that maybe underestimated, but still um, success factors is the uh, the quality of the of the language in your proposal. So you might consider. Um, uh, having some um, somebody uh, speaking the language that you're writing the proposal in um, 
a native speaker reading the proposal through and, and seeing that the language is 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 clear and 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 understandable uh, and so it's it's also well written so that the evaluator can can really find the information that he or she is looking for um, quickly then of course the quality of the information that you are providing so that uh, be coherent and precise and specific so answer the question that you are asked in each of the part of the of the application and 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 yeah so so well that's that's a very simple tip but and just uh, be sure that you you answer the, the the all the aspects that were asked in in different parts of the of the application be sure that if you are working different partners are working uh on different parts of the of the application package that that you would have at least somebody going through the whole application and making sure that all information is coherent in in different parts of of the of the application because otherwise it it will give um, um, well not so good picture of, of of the preparation of the project if it's not coherent the information in in all parts of the application and it might be also a good idea to have your application uh, like tested by someone someone outsider who is not familiar with your field or with your project so that if they are able to understand what your project is about then it's also possible for the outside EU evaluator to quickly understand what you're aiming at with your project so preserve time for also these kind of last checkups that you are making it really clear and uh, coherent and also if possible to for instance ask advice or help from international office or if you have any kind of a, um, kind of office for um, research project or any other kind of these EU funded projects that they have experience with writing applications so they might also give uh, valuable hints for how to actually then to polish the application so it's really really uh, easily readable. I'm not sure if uh, a lot of attention will be given to the summary but at least from mm -hmm. my early experience with the Erasmus Mundus programs we got the tip to actually to really put a lot of effort on the summary because that's one of the parts that the evaluators read first, really a short text where you actually sell your project. And if that already gives them the, the idea, oh, that seems interesting that so they'll have already more positive approach to the rest of your application when it's, it's well written. And you're referring to the summary in the e form. Yes. No. Yes. Yes. Okay. So those were actually the tips from our side. I will just, um, we have two slides including links to, to, um, to these uh, call materials and additional information. So I will just go through them explaining what those are. So the Erasmus Plus, it's actually the, the website of, of the executive agency and with information for the, for the capacity building action specifically the first link and then the call uh, that we are now uh, uh, been focusing on uh, the 2019 call is under the next link and then we have the well the website of, of edufi or still the previous organization that we used to be called simo so on that website you you will find some information in finnish and in in swedish uh, and then uh, there is also the link um, on the again on the agency's website um, to different national Erasmus plus offices in in certain partner countries so really um, we do encourage you to contact those if you are working with the with the countries that have a national Erasmus plus office also if you if the um, if you don't have a national Erasmus plus office in in your country then uh, the EU delegation might be also one one contact point that that you you might be uh, might find useful when when planning your proposal and of course the ministries and and the higher education institutions themselves. But then there is a lot of guidance material available. Um, so it's um, for example, well, please make use. Uh, all the all the project planning 
guidelines and guidebooks and, and tutorials that you, you will find. There are a lot of them and, and especially on the, on the LFM and the whole um, logical framework approach. Uh, this one slide that I showed you is only a picture of the, of the table and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a complete approach, how you plan your project. So it, it would make sense to look into additional materials explaining the LF, LFA. Um, so that's one tip. But then focusing on, on what type of materials are available for this call. Um, so there is, uh, the um, agency is providing Erasmus Plus e-tutorials. So they are more um, on general level covering international dimensions. So the, the um, dimensions of Erasmus Plus um, working, well, focusing on, on working with the, with the countries outside uh, Europe. But there are also some e-tutorials uh, for this call specifically. So there is one, uh, how to successfully prepare your project proposal. There is a recording and the slides available. So this is from the agency. Uh, then there was also one info session focusing on Asia. So uh, if, you, if you are planning a project on, on Asia, that, that, would be, that would be beneficial for you. And then uh, this presentation and the recording, as well as um, presentations and webinars from previous years. Uh, are available on, on our own website. So, and we will send you the link once we have published this uh, these slides uh, as well as um, as as this uh, this recording. When it's available, we will send all the all the uh, registered participants a, a link to this information. But you will find it uh, behind this capacitate vahvistamishankkeet on on our website. Do you have any idea when will be the the slides and recording available? Well, end of this week, next week? Maybe end of this week. Yeah. Yeah. First, right. Hopefully by end of this week. But uh, these slides, we have the slide show available. So if you are really in a hurry, we, please send us an email and we can send it to you if that's if that's more more practical for you. But we will try to try to get it on the on the website as as soon as possible. So now I think we have five minutes to go. Yes. So if you have any any questions or yes, yes. okay. One question already. So if you have any more questions, please send them to us. We have five minutes at yes. least to answer them. So and we'll try again. Maybe I mentioned at this sure. at this point that okay, we have this webinar, these slides, and and information available. You can contact us uh, by email and call us anytime and we will try to support you with your proposal. And as mentioned, um, as we are not directly involved in the selection process, we can also comment your proposal directly. This would not be the case for the, for the, for the uh, activities that we are also responsible for the selection. But uh, for the capacity building action, we can actually, you can uh, send us the, your proposal, or, or if you have some specific questions, then we we might be able to help you. It's of course time is limited, and there are a lot of a uh, lot of applicants for this for this activity as well. But in case we have the time and and the possibility to do that, we can also also we might be able to to comment your your proposal as well. Um, yes, there was one specific question regarding the LFM. Mm -hmm. table that uh, is the limit actually to pages because it's not mentioned in the in the document okay i have to admit that for this year i didn't check it last year it was two pages okay um, but as here it doesn't in the in the document it doesn't mention any limit okay as for some other reports i think has been mentioned that like for open text boxes it says like how many characters mm -hmm. you have space for mm -hmm. but at least here for the lfm table doesn't say anything but okay that um i have to admit that i haven't checked that limitation for this year if it's uh, removed mm. then that's a uh, good news for you because it yeah. has been very challenging to fit the 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 logical framework matrix in two pages so we can look into that and check but you're yeah. right that it's it's not mentioned here. Maybe some others have already looked into that. Are there other colleagues online who have experience from previous years and have checked? I think you would 
at the latest notice that when you start filling in yes. the table, it, yes. there's a limit. But. So we can check that and get back to you. When we send when we send the, the information about the slides, we can add the answer to this question as well. So we will look into it and get back to you. Yeah. Did we have any other? Not at this point. Okay. It seems that we have been really comprehensive with all the information or we have been only going for a lunch or something is yeah. quite late. So but Okay, but yeah. in that case, so thank you for joining. We hope the best and uh, success for your proposal and we are um, at your disposal if, if yeah. you if you have any questions and and we could support you in 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 any way so then please send us please an email us. yeah okay but thank you so much thank you bye bye